Several months prior to this date, I received a phone call from Yoram who stated that he had identified some extraordinary raw materials that would create amazing results if we were to use them in our uh, product line. So I eagerly volunteered to finance an expedition to Vanuatu as long as I could uh, take with us a full media crew so that we could record all the events on this expedition. So we packed up our bags, I kissed my son goodbye, and then we were taken to the LA airport where we boarded a flight to Vanuatu. After a, a grueling 14-hour flight, we arrived into the Sydney airport for the day. And um, my, I have that picture right here, I'm not sure. I, I think I'm just showing how cute Benny is when he takes his photographer, his pictures. <laughs> Okay, here was the man of the hour. This man is Leon. Leon is a botanist. Leon and Yoram have been uh, friends for years and years. And Leon is the man who knows where the uh, exotic flowers and plants and flora exist around the world that uh, can uh, create uh, extraordinary results. And so Leon and Yoram have collaborated for many years on uh, different issues. So Leon was the man in the know. And uh, on this day, Leon and I, there's a beautiful skyline of Australia. Leon uh, took me to the botanicals gardens in Sydney for a crash course in botanicals. We spent several hours there and he uh, uh, tried his best to educate me on the uh, flora that was indicative to the islands in the South Pacific. To my surprise, I learned about a lot of other things I hadn't been told about. Uh, these might look like coconuts hanging from a tree to you, but uh, they're bats. Here's a closer look. There are trees after trees after trees full of bats. We had swarms of bats uh, flying around the islands every single day at sunset. It was a, a majestic sight to see. In the botanical gardens, we walked through to uh, view absolutely beautiful types of plants, different uh, flowers, orchids, all extremely exotic. And after uh, we finished the a tour of the botanical gardens. We gathered uh, to have lunch and do a little shopping. To my surprise, uh, but of course I should have expected it, There's you can buy kangaroo in Australia. After um, lunch and a little bit of shopping, we boarded another flight that took us to the islands of Vanuatu. We landed um, on the main island and set up headquarters in a very small hotel uh, called the Kayaviti there. They took very good care of us. The night sky was absolutely beautiful and every single night we had the uh, privilege of counting the falling stars. Oh, there's another cute picture of Benny. The people on the island were absolutely beautiful. They had um, vivid, healthy skin. They smiled. Oh, there's Leon <laughs> trying to fit in with the <laughs> local natives. Um, and we also found that there were several generations of islanders who had not seen uh, a woman with white skinned and blonde hair, which I found fascinating. Another thing I found fascinating about this islands were the spiders. Now, I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but everywhere you walk, there were spiders. You could turn a corner and walk into a web of spiders. In fact, I did that and remind me to tell you one day about that. So. Um, Often, I, I actually wore a whistle around my neck so that when I landed in a nest of spiders, I could blow as loud as I could and they could come and get me. Um, from the main island, we flew to yet a smaller island where uh, we would find the uh, volcano, Mount Yasser. And uh, once arrived, we were greeted by the sons, the son of the chief who had the only vehicle on the island uh, who took us to our camp. On the way to the camp, we um, ran into a little roadblock to our surprise and delight. Uh, this was the day that the uh, local natives were gathering to celebrate some type of unity or united day. In fact, uh, the song that they sang was uh, unit, Unity. And the uh, groundspeople 
Uh, you can see here that this woman was making a skirt. They're all handmade. Uh, they're dyed with natural uh, flower pigments, and every single skirt uh, was representative of the family heritage. You can see the beautiful, beautiful skirts and the type of clothing these people wore. We were also very surprised to find that there were absolutely no other camera people, no video people, no news media. Uh, at all gathered in this location to celebrate this day of unity. Here are pictures of the older tribesmen, just some fascinating pictures of the um, those who were gathered together on that day and they stayed very separate uh, and each uh, tribe from the islands had a very distinctive look and uh, mannerism of, um, of speaking and even formality. This was the feast uh, gathered uh, by the people uh, and uh, uh, just set in one location so that all could feast together after this day of celebration. And of course we couldn't help but capture one of the beautiful young girls with our uh, lip color there. The children are very happy. They play very simple games as you can see here uh, made of rocks and stones. And uh, this is a shot of how large their feet are. Um, I'm not sure that you can truly tell but their feet are probably two to three times larger than ours because we, uh, they do not wear shoes and they are more or less mountain people uh, walking up and down mountains in small thin paths living on. That is what you are looking at is uh, also the ground that is in the floor of their huts which are very small huts. Oh, this is a shot of their, the first time they're raising their flag to unite. Another great shot of a, a local man from Vanuatu. Um, in the background, you can see this long hut. Uh, these huts, not, not only do they live in the huts, but these are also, also, also their stores and their shops. And you can see that they're woven together. Uh, by hand, which is just an amazing feat, and the the stools that they sit on, sit on are carved from the um, trunks of trees. There's a typical scene of a village. Um, after the um, procession, we continued on to where our base uh, would be for the next uh, many many days, and this is called uh, Port Resolution. This uh, port was purported to be the campsite of Captain Cook when he um, uh, sailed his ship into the harbor and climbed uh, up some tall rocks at this beautiful site and um, uh, set up uh, camp for quite a few days uh, while they explored the islands of Vanuatu. Okay, that's the spider between the gate on the way to the front door of my hut that I had to navigate around every single day. And I have to tell you, I took apart his web one day and he had it up the next. So they don't go away, they're very territorial. And um, well, that's another story. Uh, that's one of the huts uh, that, I think that was one of the, cam the huts the camera crew stayed in. More spiders between the huts, so you do not walk outside at night without a light because you will walk into these spiders. And there's another hut that one of the uh, crew stayed in. This is the inside of the huts. Uh, the nets um, hang over each bed and you must put the nets over you at night. Otherwise you will have one of those spiders on your face while you're sleeping. And in fact, one morning I woke up and there was the skin of a spider. You know how they like snakes shed? There was the skin of a spider on the net. Up, oh, another spider. Oh, that was a from standing from atop of our camp. That is the site that we saw directly across from us. And from out of those, the little caves and the nooks and the trees along uh, this cove are sleeping during the day, all the bats. And I mean, there are millions of bats that come out every single night at sunset. Uh, that's down below our campsite. Uh, every morning we would walk down there and go swimming with the dugon. There were two dugon there, and uh, dugons happened to like the scent of women. So when I would get in the water in the morning, the dugon would come over and start and want to play. That's how we got to swim with the dugon. They're quite large, um, kind of a cross between a well and a porpoise, I would say. And they, um, 
They are very friendly and curious. And uh, this particular one was probably, I would say, 12 feet long. Probably weighed a couple tons. Okay, this was uh, atop our uh, campsite. And uh, as you can see, it's just an absolutely beautiful uh, scene. It's very serene. The weather is beautiful there. Uh, every day, at a certain time, we would turn on our satellite phone and dial to, I would dial uh, to the office, and um, Yorm would dial to his uh, manufacturing facility. And uh, it was when we were on this phone that I was informed that the gloss that I had okayed and signed off on was removing our lip color. So <laughs> we kind of cut the sh sh uh, trip uh, shorter as a result of that uh, because Yoram and I both had to return to the States as soon as we could to figure out why the gloss was uh, removing the lip color. Some of, some of you distributors might remember that. Okay, it's time to set out to find our botanicals and um, the ash that Yorm was looking for. Beautiful floras. The island was just, it was magical. It was beautiful, green, lush, moist. You were never dry. You were constantly wet. In fact, the clothing that you had to wear is the kind of clothing they sell at outdoor shops that uh, continually remove moisture from your body so that you don't get unnecessary rashes. That uh, is a picture taken as we are standing in front of one half of the root of a tree. Is that amazing? That is just one half of the root of the tree. And the roots grew down in little uh, spindles into the ground. Uh, not as one whole uh, entity, but as thousands of separate tiny little, str st it's called a strangler fig. Okay, these are, um, this is a marketplace uh, for the local townspeople. And this is um, how they gather their goods or whatever it is they're raising. And they, they uh, sit all day long and trade uh, at um, crossroads uh, throughout the island so that uh, the neighboring um, uh, villagers can trade uh, for food uh, based upon services or maybe pigs and chickens, whatever the need was, they would just come to these marketplaces and swap for the day. That's another view, view of our uh, beautiful port. These are the children, aren't they darling? Uh, the children, as I said, were always very curious and happy and sweet. Here's an example of a, a village set back in the woods. And Yorm befriended uh, a chief. Now, interesting enough, we uh, did not see a lot of elderly folks on this island. And um, we just assumed on our own, no one told us uh, that this is fact, but we assumed on our own that they just didn't live that long. And that's why uh, they were so rare to find. While in camp, I took the time to interview Yoram. Uh, we do have this on tape, and we just haven't created a production for it yet, but it's quite a fascinating interview. Some scenes of the film crew interviewing. Another picture of Benny. <laughs> and here's the film crew all uh, set up and ready to uh, take off to uh, Mount Yasser. And that's how we rode around uh, from the camp to Mount Yasser. I think it was about an hour and a half, half drive in the Jeep uh, one way. Uh, this shows the terrain around uh, the volcano. It was uh, uh, on a certain s uh, portion of Mount Yasser. It's completely desolate. It looks like it, it is a barren land. It has uh, 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 different types of formation of, of hard rock, I'm sure created by lava, sand, silt, uh, and there's absolutely no greenery uh, growing in certain sections. And you can tell that when the... Um, when the volcano erupted in what direction the wind was blowing and that is of course uh, where the um, the lava flowed and completely wiped out whatever was in its path. Here we are standing in a vast uh, segment of the wasteland of Mount Yasser. We uh, walked around, here shows uh, different variations of the terrain. 
against a, around Mount Yasser. We walked around looking for uh, different types of volcanic ash, not, not always the darkest, deepest colors, but it had uh, different weights and textures. And of course, we took uh, back to camp with us several uh, different bags to that would uh, allow us to continue certain experiments. And of course, when you're on Mount Yasser or near it, who could help but try to climb to the very top? None of us actually got to the entire top, to the very top rather, but you can see probably three bodies closer to the top. Um, and bet me, those are the three young guys. Uh, Yoram, myself, and Leon stopped about right there. It's extremely windy uh, up at uh, up on the volcano, and w you can see off to the right. Those were the bags that we were piling up and filling, uh, full of um, ash from different portions of the volcano. In fact, we would walk up uh, the volcano every 200 feet and take a new segment or section of uh, ash and uh, mark it and then uh, one of the helpers would ride it down the volcano because you could get on it and slide down. It was quite fun for them. Now uh, this was taken from the highest point of the volcano and I think Ian Fishman is the one who climbed th to the very, very highest point but isn't it interesting that you can see the perimeter of where the lava stopped flowing here and where uh, the, the uh, uh, Greenlands were able to flourish even in that type of uh, very acidic atmosphere. Those plants are in fact the plants that would have adapted to that type of environment so that they could thrive and that that was part of the uh, intrigue and majesty about um, the the photosynthesis process of the plants uh, that lived in that area. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure we, where we found that creek but it was still in the um, volcanic area right at the base of the volcano and uh, we tried as best we could to rinse the volcanic ash f away before we got on the car. Here's a shot of the volcano at night erupting and this is a you can see in the middle of the black that is a shot taken by one of our cameramen that looked deep down into the opening of the top of the volcano and that is lava but it's so far down there it looks like a little speck but that lava was actually bubbling and we would stand there like you know we dared <laughs> we played games we would stand there at the opening of the volcano and watch the bubbles and we'd start predicting when it was going to erupt and as soon as we learned the pattern we could tell pretty well when it was going to erupt and of course we'd take off for our lives and uh, once we knew it had finished erupting we'd run back up there and see who could come to the closest to predicting when it was going to erupt again. Uh, it was really fascinating. It was a very surreal uh, uh, experience. It's a once in a lifetime experience to actually be looking down into the mouth of an active volcano. That's a shot of your arm looking down into the mouth of the volcano. Um, once back at the camp, uh, we set out, uh, set up some experimental tables. In fact, this is on the porch of my uh, hut. And we began to mix uh, certain uh, cosmetic and skincare items uh, so that we could identify properties and weights uh, together. And of course, I had, I had no one to practice on. <laughs> so I volunteered the men, Leon's appreciating our lip color. I had to do up Yoram, who made a beautiful model. We were testing for uh, viscosity and, of course, the long-lasting properties, and I believe this particular one was our mascara. Yeah, that was our mascara. Uh, we also played with the uh, different weights of volcanic ash in the uh, skin care items. And uh, once we identified which weights that we needed, we returned to the volcano with even a larger group of men and uh, began to pack uh, large, uh, very large bags of volcanic ash uh, into the truck uh, so that uh, ultimately the truck would take the bags of volcano to the boat and ship it back to the main island. Still experimenting. Now this 
This is the picture taken from the volcano. You'll see a white streak right in the middle of the frame. That is the Great Sacred Tribal Waterfall. And it doesn't look very high, but it is. It's very high. I don't know the elevation. And uh, we gain passage to the Sacred Waterfall. And uh, on uh, the way to the Sacred Waterfall, we were stopped by a group of people who said that we may not pass, be, uh, our party may not pass, because not only were we strangers, this was a very primitive tribe of people. Uh, many of the children did not wear clothes, the pigs and the horses, and uh, not the horses, the pigs and the roosters and the dogs next were running around in the village area. Um, and they were, um, the men and women were freely walking about, but you could tell, tell that they were sharing all the uh, duties of the day and cooking in large masses to feed the whole tribe at once. And you could tell that they lived in a shared work type community. Uh, that was the picture of the chief. And these are, uh, the men are trying to gain passage past uh, the chief um, with me. Uh, but uh, they stated that no white woman has ever been there before and uh, they actually made a deal with them and uh, at this point I can't remember what the deal was but uh, it was some form of payment in I think chickens. Um, the deal was this is the bodyguard uh, who watched me very carefully and as I walked through the village I could not walk with the men they sent a man uh, to escort me through the village and at all times, I had to look at the ground. I could not look up and look at anyone until I reached the other end of the village. Here's a picture of uh, their pigs are very important to them, and this pig had his own little hut. Uh, this was a woman and child that we saw in the bushes uh, on the other side of the village. So as soon as we passed the other side of the village, uh, we started a very long trek through a dark forest, which means that we had to traverse a river and enter into literally a black forest. And the black forest had headhunters, a uh, tribe of headhunters that lived in it. And you had to almost run. We ran for almost an hour through the black forest up the, the hill, slowly uh, uh, increasing in our elevation. Um, until we had reached the other side of the Black Forest uh, where the, white, the Sacred Waterfall was. This is taken from the Sacred Waterfall looking across the valley to Mount, Mount Yasser. Okay, this is, um, this is a picture of, uh, I believe, the following day when uh, the people, the tribes people, who we had hired uh, to help load the ash onto the truck uh, had arrived back to uh, Port, Re Port Resolution where we were staying and we were going to begin our trek to uh, try to arrange for the ash to be delivered to the other island. We drove the truck to the Kimbi and you can see uh, the trucks in front of the Kimbi and uh, stayed there until we were sure that the ash was loaded. After uh, the ash was loaded, uh, we had another day to stay on the island, so Benny decided to go for a swim. The water was uh, skin temperature, but do not jump into green water. We learned this from Benny. Benny was very ill for the next five days after his green water experience. And by the way, the tribe's kids were, were playing and swimming in that water. But it, our bodies, of course, were not adapted to the type of bacteria that's in that green water. So he was quite ill. Ah, that night was a quite a special feat. We were allowed to uh, join a couple of elders and a virgin 14-year-old in the Kava Kava circle that evening. Uh, the Kava Kava ritual is a, a ritual for men. I think it's just a guy thing, you know. They, it's like going out and smoking cigars, except you get a big bit more of a thrill than smoking a cigar. Um, kava Kava is taken from the Kava root, and if done correctly, is, uh, is prepared correctly, is a aphrodisiac. Uh, the Kava Kava is chewed by, has to be chewed by a 14-year-old virgin and then he spits it into a pail uh, where that he um, uh, grinds it and blends it with water so that it's more like a paste 
and then you have to take a half of a coconut, which is a cup, dip it into the pail and drink it. Yes, ladies, that is true. <laughs> and it only tastes bad one time because once you, once you taste it, once you can't taste it again. Okay, the rule is we're sitting on the, co on the log and when you're sitting on the log, you can't talk. Everyone has to be very quiet as they are called up one by one to partake of the kava handed to you by the virgin. And you must gulp it all at once and return to your seat on the log. So each of us one by one took our kava and um, gulped down the first one. And then once returning to the log, <laughs> it didn't take long until you felt kind of happy. And after that, you didn't taste the second and the third one. You just kept getting happier. After the happy time, we decided to go to a neighboring village where we heard they were having a party. They were actually um, um, celebrating a, uh, a sacred day, and we were invited uh, to join them. Uh, and we had the great honor of dancing with them and listening to their beautiful music and uh, singing with their children in their huts and uh, learning more about the townspeople. This is a picture of um, drinking. This is the way we drank our juice, which was through a coconut. And uh, this is a shop uh, where that once we returned to the next day, once we returned to the main island, uh, this was the shipping shop where we could then arrange for our uh, ash to be taken off the boat and to be put into large containers that would, uh, uh, s I guess, then be placed on a freighter that came to the largest island once a month and eventually end up in the LA Harbor. Uh, before we left that, of course, we had to do a few more beautiful waterfall tours. These are just spectacular displays of nature. We gathered a couple pictures there. This is one of the locals. Next, we had we enjoyed uh, bizarre food. This this is bat. Uh, bat is a little strong uh, and uh, quite meaty, and is something I'm glad I experienced at least one time. Yum. While on the main island, we were invited uh, to the home of a, uh, a designer and a, a collector for uh, a, a man who had some, uh, one of the largest collections of South Pacific art in his home. And uh, we'll flip through and show you a piece, few pieces of the art. Now these poles, ah, that's a tree. This pole is... Um, is the painted lady, and I have this painted lady in my backyard. These poles are carved from uh, the bark of a tree. And they're, they're actually, I believe they're fern trees and they're very light, and this is the painted lady of fertility. This, this is a table that's carved out of one piece of driftwood. It's in uh, Yorm's house right now, but we have um, dual custody over it. Uh, he has more room for it. It's actually a spectacular carving with uh, dozens of sea life uh, creatures carved into it. If you could look at it uh, more closely, those of you who have a chance to go to his house will. And uh, these are the drums. We have several in our backyard. Yorm um, has several as well. What happened was we had a, a large container only half full of ash. So we had the opportunity to purchase some of the artifacts from the local tribes people, you know, uh, uh, give them uh, currency, their local currency for their good works, and uh, we would have mementos to enjoy when we returned. Uh, this is inside of the home of this uh, famous artist who uh, designed clothing and uh, um, was actually a, a very, a spectacular character in the area who had the specific, the large uh, collection of art I'm in his library, looking at, at hand-drawn uh, maps of the area from Captain Cook. That's his painted skull. These are some of the clothes that this uh, man had uh, created. 
We brought uh, several of them back uh, for our employees. This is the um, the ash that had uh, just been uh, picked up from the Kimby, and now we're taking it to customs and preparing it to uh, load into the container. That's Benny overseeing the um, loading of the the carvings and the ash. This is one of the largest. Uh, Yorm has this one in his yard. Took a crane to uh, take it up to the top of the Hollywood Hills and insert it in uh, his front yard, by the way. <laughs> um, it, was it, it, it tipped over the truck. <laughs> but they finally uh, mastered it and uh, were successful at getting it into the container. Uh, the day before we left uh, the adventure, Benny took me um, diving. Uh, now that we had seen the outside of the land, we wanted to see the underneath part. And it was the most spectacular diving that I have seen anywhere in the world. They have um, massive formations in this part of the world, for those of you who are diver enthusiasts, because um, it has not been uh, pilfered. The formations underwater are virtually untouched by modern day divers, and therefore the formations are uh, feet, many, many feet large across uh, the base. Lar huge sponges just in every color of the rainbow. It's spectacular. So there we are on our dive trip and that's the next day we all uh, head out for the airport to return to our homeland where yet another adventure begins. <laughs>